Good morning, everyone. So we're going to hit on chapter two here, which is basic exercise science concepts. So bear with me on my voice. I'm trying to not get any sicker than I feel. So um, let's go through each one of these. So we'll see what happens. Uh, there'll be some terms that you should know from previous courses, and then there may be some new material in here that um, should be able to get you through um, through the rest, the remainder of this course, you know, in terms of all the chapter material that'll help you to prep for this exam. So, um, obviously, we're going to talk about structure, function, and movement for uh, what we consider the kinetic chain, which I know that you all know about. Um, but um, NASM refers to that as the human movement system. So, we'll, we'll you know, if you hear human movement system, just understand that it's back and forth between that and kinetic chain, okay? Um, so basically at that point there, what you'll do is by having these, you know, structural and physiological understandings, what you'll end up being able to do is have a better understanding of how the body moves in general, how it operates and everything like that, all right? Um, so what are we going to get into here? Uh, an understanding for the nervous system, skeletal, muscular, and then the endocrine systems, and then how they respond and adapt to exercise, okay? Now, for those of you who have taken exercise physiology, this should be a really good ref refresher because we did go over those last class, all right? So, in terms of the human, you know, human movement system, or if you, ref if you ever see um, any, if you ever see it referred to as that, throughout the, the book or the PowerPoints, so understand that the human movement system or the HMS is, again, interchangeable. But <coughs> what, what are we talking about here? Movement accomplished through uh, nervous, skeletal, and muscular functioning um, in unison, or not in unison, but basically in a synchronized manner, okay? Uh, they work to produce movement, um, or as they say, motion, or what we consider to be kinetic function. Um, and then they must work together to produce sound movement. So if you have any sort of dysfunction, or if you have, just like if you were to have a chain and it broke, if you have a break in that chain, there that usually means that there is some disrupted movement pattern and things like that. So, you know, we, we understand that Appropriate movement patterns require the kinetic chain to be able to function correctly and to not have any imbalances along its lines. So um, we need to be aware of that and observant of that as we work with our people. All right, so again, kinetic means force, and the chain refers to the links that, or the links that form together that create a system. So if you see, if you just take a chain off of someone's neck, well, there's links that make up that chain, and that chain eventually forms, you know, in a certain, a certain length to become one, okay? But if any time that chain becomes disrupted, that's when we have an issue. So what ends up happening here is that we end up with all those links being able to work together that, you know, then at that point, the human movement that comes from that can be altered in a positive way, okay? So... If we were to take, you know, and start walking, we understand that we have to have a, um, we have to have a, a basic functioning for everything, and we have to be able to, um, oh, so for walking, see, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked there. Um, for walking, if you were to get your belly button, which is roughly your center of gravity, in front of your base of support, we understand that, that that's going to make you take that first step. Well, we understand that at that point, when you step forward, you have a lot of functions that start to happen. There's a, maybe a slight dorsiflexion of the ankle, meaning the toes are going to come back to you. Um, at that point, the knee might slightly flex. The hips are going to flex. The spine, because it's, you know, spine might have a little bit of flexion to it because you're leaning a little bit forward. Not overly aggressive, but it's there. So those chains have been altered, but that's basically making synchronized movement. All right. And so that's, you know, basically what we just refer to is how walking is one of the most unbalanced, you know, motions that we have. But it is basically affected by the fact that our body knows how to handle those motions over years and years of walking. That's why, you know, a baby who's trying to learn, you know, trying to walk for the first time versus an adult is vastly different. Um, 
And this is what we were talking about before. If one component of the kinetic chain is not working properly, it will affect the others and ultimately affect the movement. So if you have imbalances within muscles, if you have joint issues, if you have injury, you know, previous injuries, all of those can affect that kinetic chain. And then ultimately what will happen is the movement that you want to produce at that point is not going to fly accordingly. Okay. So the nervous system, we understand, is the nerves within our system. Um, one of the main organ systems of the body. Um, it's able to transmit signals um, from nerve to nerve. It's able to transmit signals from, you know, uh, the brain to the, you know, all the way down to the, the working muscles, all right? So when we talk about the nervous system, there's a few, you know, components that we talk about, and one of them is the main component or the central nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord. Okay, um, nothing too crazy about that there. Um, pretty straightforward on that. Now, the PNS, the peripheral nervous system, is um, a, um, a subset of the central nervous system, and its job is to communicate with the central nervous system. Now, um, you have the autonomic nervous system, which is the ANS, and you have the peripheral nervous system, which is the PNS. And basically what happens is the peripheral is going to be able to detect stimuli and it's going to then be able to give off um, efferent signals to then provide movement. All right, so it's, a, it's an, a voluntary action at that point where the ANS is involuntary, which means like um, organ function and things like that, you know, are, you know, like our stomach being able to, to be able to do its job, the gastrointestinal system with the smooth muscle that they all have in them, they are all automated, you know, and it's, it's automatic, autonomic, all right, your heart, your lungs, etc. that we don't have to tell ourselves to breathe, we don't have to tell our heart to pump every, every, you know, one to two seconds, all right, so it, it just becomes, you know, uh, an involuntary mechanism at that point, all right, um, so without the nerves, you don't have that communication. And basically at that point, you're not able to process information to then give a signal to, you know, basically process the information, you know, accept the feedback, process it, and then interpret it, and then be able to give the response, which is usually movement at that point. <coughs> now they call those primary functions. What I just explained is sensory, which is gathering information from the external environment or actually internal environment as well. Um, integrative meaning that you are going to interpret, you are going to process, you're going to basically take what the sensory is, you know, sensory information is and kind of formulate a plan as to what's going to happen, but it happens in such a short period of time that it just it's amazing how fast the brain and spinal cord are able to to, to do this. And then the motor function is the actual movement component of that which is the response to that sensory information all right and this is exactly what we just got into so um i'm not going to go back over this but understand that what i just said previously is exactly what we're referring to in this situation with the sensory integrative and the motor you know functioning so when we talk about proprioception what you're basically doing is you're sensing position of you know basically you're, you're having an understanding of where you are in relationship to space but as he, you know what we talk about here is relative position of adjacent parts of the body and what are they doing you know what is it that they're doing so you know I think from chapter one you talked about a pro proprioceptively rich environment and that's going to come back to this right here so what we're doing here when we're training people in a proprioceptive, you know, sense is we're trying to improve um, three functions, you know, balance, coordination, and posture. And by improving those, then that's where we, you know, that's building your base. That's building the foundation for what we're trying to do for our movement. All right. So if you can get yourself into a, a better balanced, coordinated, and postural situation, then trying to move on. That's this is why the stabilization section is so critical in the OPT model is because of this, because this is where you get the proprioception from. So um, at that point there, what you're doing is you're adapting to your surroundings. Um, 
with without a conscious effort. So basically what you're able to do is you're able to move through things and do things without even realizing that you're doing them because it just becomes over time, not right away, but over time it becomes second nature. Okay, so by training the nervous system, this is one of the main reasons why whenever we talk about the first um, improvements that comes through the system, okay, um, maybe a test question at some point throughout the course, but um, definitely good to understand is that we know our first set of improvements is never muscularly, it doesn't mean we're going to have, you know, large muscle mass gains, it doesn't mean strength is going to be improved, although strength does become improved, but what does it improve from? It's the fact that our nervous system is more proprioceptive. It's able to ensure that our movement patterns are correct and that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Therefore, if you're in proper alignment, so we're talking about posture, balance, and coordination all at once, then what ends up happening is you can reduce your injury risk at the same time. All right. So as we referred to before, we know that we move based on sensory input. So, um, I mean, when you're scared, you move faster. You know, when you're angry, you, you may move faster. When you're stressed, you may move slower because muscles that should not be contracted are contracted. So we are responding to what our body is giving us, whether it's internal or external. Okay. Um, so what we need to understand is that... Um, the nervous system controls that, all right? So that's why when we talk about a multi-sensory environment, it's probably one of the best ways to incorporate um, that that sense of, of change or not always being in that same pattern. That's why people become stale in their training, and that's why they're always like, oh, I, you know, I feel like I reached a plateau and I can never get out of it. It's because they're not willing to go into that, like we said here, multi-sensory environment. So even just doing something as simple as um, standing on one leg while doing bicep curls can create a, a change in what we're doing, okay? So, um, what, you know, what are we trying to say here is that if we're trying to train the nervous system, we gotta do it long-term, um, and that we need to make sure that, you know, what we're doing is going to affect the nervous system to a greater extent because it's just going to, you know, the nervous system is going to be able to call upon more motor units. And we talked about motor units previously where that's a, the nerves and the muscle fibers that come in contact with those nerves that are, you know, talk to be fired upon. Okay. So, um, of the nervous system, you're talking about the neuron. All right, the neuron is composed of three sections, the cell body, the axon, and the dendrites, okay? Um, the axon is really the communication portal for, you know, it's a long stem that we have that can, you know, will eventually lead us to, if we have talk about the nerve, the axon will lead, you know, that nerve to those, to that fiber or fibers, Okay. Um, the cell body is, you know, that's where it says here, your cell organelles or your, you know, your major components there of your nucleus, mitochondria, your lysosomes and your Golgi complexes. And then from there, your dendrites are kind of like the, um, what's the best way? They're, they're kind of like the tree branches that come off of, of the trunk of a tree. Um, and what dendrites do is they gather information from other areas of the body and the signals can pass through many dendrites before it gets to the, you know, where it needs to be. So um, it is a connection point where you can pass um, information from, you know, dendrite to dendrite and, and the signal can still be sent. So um, if we look here, I'll blow this picture up just a little bit here so you can kind of get a, an, an interpretation of what we're talking about. Um, some of the things that we, you know, whenever we talk about, you know, gray and white matter, um, understand that that usually is a component of what we would talk about myelination or the myelin sheath that surrounds the axon. Um, myelin sheath is a fatty, you know, fatty covering and, you know, with lipids. And what it does is, is it creates a housing that allows a signal to blow through that area very quickly. All right. So depending upon, you know, what type it is, depending upon where the location is, some can be my some nerves can be myelinated, others will not be. So if it's myelinated, you know, then what we'll refer that to is white matter. And when you have unmyelinated 
nerves, then what we're talking about is the gray matter there, which means there's no covering for those particular nerve cells or you know the nerve the neuron itself. All right. <coughs> So the neurons, there's um, three different classifications. You have sensory, motor, and inter, what we call inner neurons. Um, sensory, also, and I'll just kind of put this there for you know for those people who have taken XFIS. These are your afferent. Motor would be your efferent. All right. And then the inner neurons are actually inner neurons. Okay, so what are sensory? They uh, they detect, um, they transmit afferent impulses from receptors to the brain you know, and or spinal cord, depending upon where it's you know where the nerve is running from. So receptors in your hands can detect you know certain things. So um, depending upon what you're referring to there, if you have some, if you have like attack that hits your fat pad of your palm then what will happen is the sensory signal will not be, you know, will be very quick and it will be, you know, hopefully quick enough where it doesn't cause pain to you, but you're going to sense that you hit that tack and then what's going to happen is you're going to have a motor neuron response where you're going to want to pull back where the brain and spinal cord will send signals to the muscles to pull your arm away from that tack, just like if you were to step on like a Lego if you have kids and you understand what that happens, you know, what happens with that. But um, that's really what we're talking about. Sensory is, is sending signals to the brain and spinal cord. Motor neurons are sending efferent signals to those muscles to move accordingly for what the stimuli was detected. And then inner neurons are those that you're basically taking nerve impulses and transmitting them from one neuron to another so that the signals can get to where they need to go. Okay. Uh, we talked about the central nervous system, understanding that it's the brain and spinal cord. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, can be detected here, if you look, um, cervical, thora uh, thoracic, and then lumbar nerves, and then you have sacral and coccygeal nerves. Basically, what we're talking about here is a little bit different than what we would see for our bony structure, which is, you know, cervical, you know, the cervical spine itself has seven vertebrae, the thoracic has 12, and the lumbar has five. Um, and then, you know, the sacral actually, you know, the coccygeal has one and the sacral has five. So those are very similar to that, but the only difference here is, you know, when we talk about nerves, the cervical nerves, there's actually eight versus the seven vertebrae. So you don't, you can't look at it from that perspective, all right? So when you're looking at the nerves, it's understanding there's one more nerve in the cervical region than there is um, the vertebrae themselves versus the thoracic, which has 12, lumbar has five, okay? So just have a, a quick understanding for that. Uh, the peripheral nervous system, uh, what we were referring to here is this is where we talk about the 12 cranial nerves and what we end up here is we have 31 pair of spinal nerves that branch out from the brain and um, spinal cord themselves. So what is their job? It's a connection for the nervous system to activate bodily organs such as muscles. Um, obviously, you can have changes in your heart. You can have changes in your gastrointestinal system. It just depends on what needs to be affected at that point, okay? Um, and then what is the, the function for that there? It's to really information from body organs back to the brain, providing a constant update of the relationship between the body and the environment. So what we're doing is we're basically... You know, at that point there, you know, relays information from bodily organs back to the brain. It's sending sensory information, and it's constantly, constantly trying to keep up with what's going on in your system. Um, if, you're, if your system detects that there's some tension going on somewhere or there's some resistance going on somewhere for whatever reason, because maybe there's some vasoconstriction, then what happens is the heart understands it has to apply a little bit more pressure, therefore blood pressure rises. That's a perfect example of that, all right? So by sensory information being constantly detected, you can see what the internal environment is really like and then make the adjustments accordingly. <coughs> and there's your, your peripheral nervous system, your somatic and your autonomic nervous systems. Your somatic is your voluntary, your autonomic is your involuntary. All right, and I, um, you know, we kind of hit on that a little bit before, but um, understanding that, you know, again, 
you can't tell your heart to beat. So that's your autonomic, you know, your autonomic. One of the things that the autonomic has, though, is it has these two other subdivisions to them, and they're called the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Whereas your sympathetic para, um, your sympathetic nervous system is its main function for that is more of excitation. So when you are ready to start exercising, you're going to have what we call sympathetic activation or, or innervation, right? which means that your body is going to want to excite. It's going to want to stay up. Um, parasympathetic is usually the relaxative nervous system where your body detects that you need to calm down and relax and you're in the system will release you know, neurotransmitters accordingly. So sympathetic, when we're talking about that, that's usually adrenaline or what we would call epinephrine and norepinephrine. And your parasympathetic would be a release of acetylcholine or if you see in textbooks or other information, ACH, then that's the neurotransmitter that's released to be able to calm you down or go into, like we said, a more of a calming mechanism. All right. Um, in terms of sensory receptors, they're, they're basically structures that are specialized to um, detect throughout the system, you know, things like it says there, heat, light, sound, taste, and motion. Um, and, you know, sensory receptors send signals back to the spinal cord. And so some of those there, um, mechanoreceptors, they are very uh, challenged by touch and pressure. Um, Noki receptors... Uh, no, or no, no, receptors are what we have that detect pain. So if you do step on that Lego and you pull your leg up into a un uncomfortable position, but you're grabbing your heel because you're so angry at your kids, that's you know those no those no receptors are basically what are being you know feeling that pain sense. Okay, um, and then they're sending that signal to the brain that that hurt. Uh, chemoreceptors, they're responsible, you know, there's some chemical interaction there where it's with, uh, you know, smell and taste. And then uh, photoreceptors are responsible for light at that point or vision. All right. Um, for this course here, what we're going to be paying attention to, as it says on the bottom there, we're going to be really paying attention to the mechanoreceptors, all right, and what they do throughout the system. Okay. Now, um, there's two types. They are your muscle spindle and your Golgi tendon organs. And they, within the name themselves, there are other joint receptors too as well. And like it says there, they respond to pressure acceleration and deceleration to the joint so that it'll help, uh, so that it doesn't provide any, like an injury component to you at all. Um, but the muscle spindle is exactly where it's located. It's in, within the belly of the muscle. And what does it do? It's, 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 it's basically a way to prevent injury or a detection system that will basically detect stretch or, as it says here, muscular length and the rate of length change. So what it's doing is it's, it's detecting stretch in the system. Golgi tendon organs are, you know, so when you go, let me go back to muscle spindles really quick. When you go to stretch somebody out and you really start to feel that discomfort, what you're doing is you're, you're basically taxing the muscle spindle at that point and making it kind of feel uncomfortable even though it's not turning on just yet um the Golgi tendon organ it's 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 sound exactly what it sounds like it's located within the tendinous area of the the muscle itself you know the, the attachment point between bone and muscle and what they do is they detect tension all right so tendons equal tension and that, you know, muscular tension and the rate of tension change are all part of that as well. So um, just, it, it's very simplistic when you talk about where is the location, but when you talk about the muscle spindle, it's a length thing. When you talk about the, ten, the Golgi tendon organ or the GTO, it is a tension thing, all right? So <coughs> we, we explained this earlier, but the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system they um, are the things that are going to change to improve our system better initially versus a person later on who's going to be more muscularly developed at that point. Um, the skeletal system, getting into that. What we're talking about is that's, that's your, your structure, your framework. Its, it's job is to um, basically serve as an attachment point for your muscles. 
and what we have are um, articulations where bones come together to create joints and those joints are what are going to help us have muscles pull and then those joints will pull accordingly okay um, now obviously we said tendons connect muscle to bone ligaments connect bone to bone and then you have cartilage which is a covering for particular areas okay articular cartilage Okay, the skeletal system has uh, two, two, two distinct regions, the axial and the appendicular skeletons, whereas the axial, the axial is more of the, the centralized region or your skull, your rib cage, and then your vertebral column. And then, um, you know, the, the appendicular is your extremities plus your shoulder and pelvic girdles. Okay, so axial is more about base and appendicular is more about movement if you really wanted to break it down into something a little bit different. Um, in terms of bone, we constantly go through um, what they say here is uh, remodeling, but what happens is, is remodeling is a constant process because we have what's called bone turnover. Bone turnover occurs at many points throughout our system, but understand that when you exercise you do break down bone cells um, or osteocytes and what ends up happening is you have to remodel them so you go through this process of osteoclasts break down those old osteocytes and then from that what ends up happening is because of that exercise training session or multiple bouts of it you're going to start to create you know new bone tissue through the function of osteoblasts causing new cells to develop okay so um the problem though becomes is that you know as we age osteoclasts become more apparent in their breakdown where we can try to offset that as much as possible but if you talk about you know osteoporosis what we're saying here is that osteoclasts are doing a better job of breaking things down versus osteoblasts keeping them built up so not you know osteoporosis is obviously not a good thing to become involved in but it just shows you that as you age, you know, those osteoclasts or the breakers, the, you know, the, the, the bone breakers, you know, the bone cell breakers, they, they basically, you know, want to become more active at that point. All right. So in terms of bones themselves, we've hit on this before, but um, the long bones, which have what we consider an epiphysis, which is the ends of the bone. You have your diaphysis, which is the shaft itself. And then you have the epiphyseal plates or the growth plates where you have the growth portions from. So as a child, that's very important, you know, to take care of because, you know, if that has an issue, it can, you know, cause deformation or issues with the growth of that particular bone. Okay. Understand that in the um, epiphysis, that's a lot of times where you're going to find your uh, spongy bone. Okay. So the spongy bone that you have at the, the ends there, that's going to be where you're going to have, um, you know, a lot of what we consider red marrow. And the red marrow is where we would just, you know, we have a lot of uh, red blood cell accumulation. Now, I'm unsure of this. But, um, you know, when we talk about the diaphysis, understand that it's the shaft. Well, within that shaft is what we consider, we call the medullary cavity. And within that cavity, you actually have what we consider it to be, or not, or what is called yellow marrow. And that yellow marrow is actually the, um, uh, the major component for creating white blood cells. So I don't want you to get confused, but understand that the epiphysis has a lot more red marrow, whereas the diaphysis has more yellow marrow and red creates red and yellow creates white okay so a little bit different than what most textbooks will explain but i'm sure that there's probably red blood cells that are created inside of the you know medullary cavity as well um, also you have what's con what's called the periosteum the periosteum is the membrane covering of the um of the bone itself it's like a you know like the, the the protective mechanism we talked about the medullary cavity and then articular cartilage is what is found at the ends of bones and that is where if you have the breakdown of articular cartilage in a joint area where two bones come together what ends up happening is that articular cartilage becomes rubbed down and you end up with a, an issue called arthritis okay or and you know itis meaning inflammation but inflammation of the joint 
Okay, short bones, you're going to find those a little, you know, they're more cube shaped, so you're going to find these more in, as it says here, the wrist and the, you know, pointing to the wrist here or the ankle itself. Flat, <sighs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, flat bones are um, what you'd find in something like your scapula. Irregular bones are going to be something like your, um, your vertebrae. Um, <clears throat> and then those are the, the, the three that they were going to, they discussed because of the major ones of the system, um, bone markings for our sake here, we have, um, depressions, uh, and like it says here, flattened or indented portions of the bone. And these depressions are usually locations like, it's, you know, like it says fossa or solstice, um, those there are usually common locations for um, muscle attachment sites, okay? You have uh, processes, or usually they're protruding bumps that you're going to have also um, connection points for muscles, tendons, and ligaments, and common ones there, condyles, epicondyles, uh, tuber uh, tubercles, and then trochanters, and those are usually marking sites for, you know, or uh, projection sites for um muscle attachment, or like it says here, other soft tissue. I explained this a little bit earlier, but understanding the uh, vertebral column itself, there are seven, um, and if you think about it, always go, you know, and the trick here is go by time of eating, 7 a.m., 12 p.m., and 5 p.m., 7 a.m., you have breakfast, that means you have seven cervical, and that's at the top, right in the middle section, your thoracic, you eat lunch at noon, so 12, there's 12 thoracic. Um, five, you use, you know, not so much anymore, but you used to eat dinner at 5 p.m., five lumbar, okay? And if you look there, you'll see that there's a curve, you know, then your sacrum and your coccyx are the, the, the finishing points there. Um, five sacral and then one coccygeal bone, um, vertebrae at, in each one of those areas. Um, if you look at the, you know, concave, convex, and then concave, understanding that concave kind of protrudes inward, convex is a protrusion outward, and that's why your vertebral column is not straight. You have an inward and inward, if you follow my, I know it's kind of, ah, it's not going to do it, but... If you follow the, the multi-arrow here, if it curves inward at the cervical, okay, outward in your thoracic, and then back inward in your lumbar. So what we want there are those curves, but understand that those curves are um, are necessary for proper spinal health. So you know that's again why we don't want to have a straight up and down or what we consider to have flat back. Okay, which truly can happen where you have no curve in your, your vertebral column at all. Joints, um, depending upon the joint location, you have um, rolling, sliding, and spinning joints. Um, and, it, and really, those structures are really important because that's the, articulate, the articulation is going, of the joint itself is going to produce a specific movement around that joint, you know, depending upon what type it is. Um, for rolling... It says, you know, where one surface rolls over another, and there they talk about the, the, the ephemeral condyles rolling over the tibia, so basically around your knee, you know, where the tibia and the fibula, the, not the fibula, the, the femur and the tibia come in contact, you have that rolling mechanism as the knee opens. Um, sliding, where one joint surface slides over the other, the tibial condyles. Um, will slide across the femoral condyles during knee extension. So when you go and you're in that seated position, you let your leg outward, you're actually going to have a sliding tibial condyle, you know, in, you know, sliding below the femoral. And then spinning, um, like it says here, the head of the radius, rotating on the end of the humerus during pronation and supination. So if you were to take your arm, put it straight out with your palm up, that's a supinated position when you take and turn the just only turn the palm so the palm faces down what you're doing is you're spinning the you know the radius and the only you know the radius from its you know the humeral position so um pretty interesting to see because you know you just think that it, you know the arm itself turns but it's actually the radius okay so rolling, sliding, and spinning are those the, uh, the three types of you know, joint motions we'll talk about 
the bone the bone system here. Okay. In terms of classification, synovial joints are the most common. Um, they actually have a cavity. So like your knee, your shoulder, your ankle, um, let's see, I'm a camp <laughs> your elbow, okay, etc. Those are all synovial joints, so therefore they're gonna, you know, they're the ones that provide the most motion. Um, they do have fluid in them, so if that fluid dries up, you can have complications there. All right. Um, non-synovial joints, you're going to have where you have little to no movement, and those synovial, those non-synovial joints are things like the sutures of your skull that are the fusion points from you know growing older. All right, but that's a you know it's a joint, but it's a non-movable joint. Um, also, kind of you know like your teeth. Your teeth are actually bone. So when the way that your teeth sit into your gums, that's actually you know it's a joint, but it's not um, movable unless you're a kid who's going to lose your teeth, but then you grow your old ones in, okay? So what's the function of a joint? Um, depending upon what its job is or where it's located, there is either going to be um, movement or stability. And the way that we talk about it in, in exercise science terms is that you're going to end up with either mobility or stability, okay? We want to have specific joints that are mobile and some that are more stable, for example, the ankle. If we had a very stable ankle, we would have a really hard time moving. If you had a very mobile ankle, then you would be able to, you know, walk, run, jog, squat, lunge, anything that you want to do because it has it's stable and it can actually move through a full range of motion. Your knee, on the other hand, wants to be more stable. It does not want to provide excessively large amounts of movement. Um, so, you know, uh, the knee being a hinge joint, the elbow is in the same category. The shoulder and the wrist, those want to be very um, mobile or man maneuverable joints. So um, they want to provide maximal movement. Um, so just, you know, and then for your spine, you want to have good cervical mobility and you want to have good um, lumbar mobility and you want to have good thoracic stability okay so you can see where the difference lies there is we want our thoracic to be stable but we don't want it to be fixed in a bad position okay so that's what we're referring to there um we said that you have links you know or your chain function there but just understand the function is what you want stability and mobility as far as connective tissue, we've we talked about ligament connecting bone to bone. Very, very appropriate for um, a stable joint. Now, again, I know I say stable versus, but again, ligaments can provide you know that stability for any any joint. So you have ligaments that are up in your shoulder, but we want our shoulder to be mobile. But those ligaments are just going to do a nice job of keeping the stability of that joint itself. Okay. The problem becomes that the connective tissue is not, um, because there's not a lot of blood flow to them, um, and because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, it's, it's, and they're not like a muscle. A muscle wants to be elastic, so it wants to stretch, and then it wants to go back to its relaxative, you know, you know uh, length. Ligaments and tendons aren't like that. You know, um, when you sprain your ankle, understand that that ligament becomes uh it, it creates a new length to that ligament and that's one and then because of that you stand the chance of getting another ankle sprain okay so that's one of the concerns that we have there um so by not repairing well what ends up happening is, is usually you're going to have to get um it usually requires a surgery to help repair it so that it can get something back to it <coughs> understanding that um with with exercise, there is what we consider weight bearing, and what we're doing is um, basically working on exercises against gravity. And so, any a lot of you know, I don't want to say that everything upright is is um, is weight bearing because that would be a wrong way to implement it. But just understanding that things that put pressure down on the system are really what we consider weight bearing. So, if you look at the third bullet point, there's swimming and cycling. There's no impact, there's no weight-bearing mechanism to that, so therefore it's not weight-bearing. Um, it says above that, running, lifting, um, or resistance training, and then calisthenics are, are considered weight-bearing. So, um, you know, that's where things like elliptical machines 
it's still weight bearing, but at the same time, you're minimizing the effects. So someone who may have knee injury would be a really good person to put on an elliptical um, for that purpose. So, um, but weight bearing itself, what does it help with? It helps with maintaining new bone and, and, and proper bone turnover to keep our bones healthy. It's going to help enhance our muscles. It's going to create um, stronger and potentially thicker connective tissues. And then it will, you know, it says burns lots of calories. Well, it depends on what the output is. But ultimately, if you're, you know, that's one of the problems though, is that burns lots of calories. Well, I'm, I would be mistaken if I didn't say that swimming and cycling don't burn calories, you know? So we have to understand that, yeah, weight-bearing exercise does burn calories, but swimming is probably one of the most um, intensified uh, forms of cardio that you can go through, you know, cardiorespiratory training. And swimming can be, you know, they say that swimming can produce four, four times the amount of energy needed or used during versus running. So, you know, just be careful when you think that, oh, swimming doesn't have to burn a lot of calories. Well, it will. It's just a different mechanism. It's not weight bearing. It's, you know, you have the, 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 the system within a, a fluid, you know, or water. <clears throat> All right. So the muscular system, and this is, you know, this is where we get into a little bit different um, sort of terminology. But what is its job? It's to pull on the skeletal system to create movement, all right, with the help of nervous system telling the muscles to fire off, okay? Um, so, like it says here, there, you know, is, uh, muscle is a compilation of lots of muscle fibers that are wrapped neatly together, and then what they do is they form um, basically fiber bundles and those bundles um, will create multiple bundles create what we call the belly or the um, the you know the, the, the epimysium of our, of our system all right and so that's the full belly all right now if we break it down like it says here the full bun the first bundle um, is the large belly itself it's you know has an outer layer called fascia. So when you talk, when you hear about fascia, that's usually the covering to the particular muscle. Um, and then the inner layer that's surrounding the muscle itself is the epimycin, which I was talking about earlier. Um, the next bun, the, the next bundle of fibers um, is what we call a, a or is, is would be considered, you know, is wrapped around by your perimysium, and it's your fascicles. All right, those are your bundle, your fiber bundles. All right, and each fascicle inside of that has many muscle fibers that are surrounded by what we call your endomysium. Okay, so each layer has you know different mo you know different amounts to it, but what it does is it um, you know creates this long muscle chain, and this muscle chain will eventually you know finish out into a tendon, and then that tendon is going to connect to the bone. Okay. <clears throat> uh, tendons, which we talked about a little bit before, but tendons again have you know very poor blood supply, just like ligaments. Um, they are that anchor point. Um, they they are very big on tension, as in the Golgi tendon organ. That's where you'll find you know they can withstand a lot of tension. All right, and they are slower to repair and adapt, but they can become stronger, just like your muscles can be. There's your your breakdown of your muscles. All right, if you look, um, the, this is your muscle belly itself. We said your epimysium within there. There's your your um, your fascicles, and then there's the little strands inside. There are the muscle fibers themselves. Okay, there's your. Uh, this is actually what we is one. It's not a you know. There's fascicles. But this is the fasciculus, and then there's your individual strand right here of your single muscle fiber. All right. Um, one of the ways that I always explain it to my students and, you know, or to you all, you are my students. Um, when you eat a chicken breast and you peel off layers of that breast, what you're doing is you're basically peeling off, you know, fascicles at that point. Um, 
that are, you know, and then you, as you break them down, you're talking about more and more um, chains that you're breaking into. So um, that's one of the processes there. So eventually what will happen is these fibers, these muscle fibers, they'll eventually break down into what we call myofibrils. And those myofibrils are where we have the contractile units or there we go, your contractile units or thick and thin filaments of um, our muscle fibers that actually produce the movement that we need or the, you know, the, 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 the pulling mechanism that we need to then create movement itself, okay? So myofibrils inside of the, and if you look over here, you have thick and thin filaments. The thick filaments are what we would consider to be your myosin, which have the heads on them. And if you look, there's like little heads that come off of that myosin. And then you have the thin filaments, which are your actin. And what they do is from Z-line to Z-line, this is actually what we call a sarcomere. And so each sarcomere is going to produce what we call a ratcheting effect where the heads of the myosin will connect to the actin itself. And when we, when we need to use that muscle, it'll, it'll attach the myosin heads to the actin and it'll start pulling closer and closer so it shortens up those z-lines and therefore you'll end up with a con you know this happens millions of times as you know we're going through exercise and um it's a it's a catch and a release a catch and a release until the muscle contracts and then it does it all over again after you relax for those short periods of time <coughs> all right there's also uh, with the actin the myosin is also what we call uh, tropomyosin and troponin and the, tro the tropomyosin is on the actin on the thin filaments and what it does is it blocks like it says here myosin binding sites where we talked about the head connecting to the actin and what happens is the tropomyosin actually um, you know it, it allows the uh, when you're in a relaxative state it stays closed when it wants to contract it'll open up and then troponin, also on the actin, um, will also is with uh, muscle contraction here. What it does, like it says here, it provides a binding site for calcium and tropomyosin when a muscle needs to contract. So calcium is really important in those really small, small microscopic areas because without, tro uh, without calcium, you won't have the excitation in that system to create the contraction that you need. So what happens here when we generate force, what happens, you know, we have the motor unit and that's the communication between the nervous system and the muscular system like we talked about, all right? And so what we can do is we can create, like it says here, movement or stabilization. So what happens here, really quickly, kind of go through this here, the electrical impulse, you know, they go... Um, down the axon to the neuron, um, um, down the axon of that particular neuron. So when it reaches that, what happens is you have neurotransmitters that are released through the synapse or the space between the neuron and the muscle fiber. And that neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, which um, is necessary to cross over and then get into um, it, its chemical form over onto um, the muscle itself, okay? So you end up with ACH crossing over. It's going to be received on the other end of the, um, on, on the muscle fiber at the receptor site. And then what it does is it stimulates muscle fibers to contract through uh, a series of chemical reactions that occur um, along the lines and then eventually creates uh, mechanical responses as well, meaning that the muscle is actually going to contract. So... What happens is you're going to end up with, if the nerve fires off, you're going to get a muscle contraction. So that's why you'll either have like a spasm or an actual produced motion because if that nerve fires, you're going to have motion. So if you ever get like a muscle spasm or like if something shakes accidentally for whatever reason, that was just the nerve saying, you know, I'm following the all or none principle. I'm either going to send it to you all the way or it's not going to respond at all. Okay. The sliding filament theory is what I explained before in this slide when I talked about how the, my the myosin heads connect to the actin here, and then what they do is they bring it closer and closer. That's actually the sliding filament theory. And what ends up happening is you can see that as they attach, the Z-lines, 
where the blue to the blue and the blue to the blue actually becomes smaller and you have a contraction, but it happens so many times, okay? So, um, you know, just for terminology purposes, when the myosin connects to the actin, what they, call, what they consider that is um, a power stroke. And then um, what happens is myosin connects and it connects to the actin and therefore pulls in. Okay, so moving from the sliding filament theory on to um, what the NASM calls the excitation contraction coupling, and really this is basically how the nerve goes through the process of um, signal sending followed by the contractive state of the muscle. So what ends up happening here, and it just kind of breaks down each thing separately, but you have an action potential or what we consider a nerve impulse. That gets sent through the neuron system and eventually will end up at the axon of the muscle fiber that it's going to enter, or the muscle fibers that it's going to innervate. Okay, so wh wh where that meeting occurs is actually at what we call the neuromuscular junction. Now, the neuromuscular junction is where nerve muscle meet, but there is actually no physical connection point there. The nerve does not connect directly to the muscle. Okay. But that neuromuscular junction where the two meet, the acetylcholine, or there's your word right there, ACH, must cross over the synapse because the, the receptacles that the ACH, you know, the vesicles that the ACH are carried in are released at the end of the neuron or at the end of the axon, technically. And the ACH is then sent across the, the synapse where it'll then bind to a receptor site within the neuro, there's the muscle fiber there, okay? So without it coming, without the ACH being sent down and transmitted through the nerve, it's not going to be released through the synapse, and then it won't be able to get to the muscle fiber. Therefore, you won't have any excitation, okay? But what happens is that action potential is continued across the muscle fiber, and then what happens is it's almost like a spark, like when you take a match and you go, you know, and it makes that sound, and then all of a sudden a flame sparks. What happens is that the muscle fiber is now having a flush, or actually a rush of calcium that gets sent, you know, into the sarcoplasm, the sarcoplasm where the actin, the thin, and the myosin thick filaments are located. When the calcium is present, that is now going to start a process where calcium binds to, as it says here, troponin. So that's where they come into contact. It opens up the active site or the binding site for where tropomyosin allows the myosin head to come up and make connection points for. Okay, so <clears throat> if we were to... Um, look at it from this standpoint, I'll just kind of give you a, let's see, actin, not actin, actin and myosin. If we were to go here and look, just kind of go through some images here, maybe we can find a decent one that kind of shows the head that we're referring to. Um, right here is a decent image. There's your actin thin, myosin thick, all right, there's your, tropo your tropomyosin, there's your troponin. When calcium makes contact with this troponin right here, it exposes that site, okay? And at that point, this head from the neck, they will then come up and make contact to the exposed site. And when it does that, it's going to take this go up, hits, and then it's going to shorten it. Or if it's going the opposite, and this will go toward the left. Now, if it's on this side and it goes up, it'll connect and go to the you know, and shorten it again. So again, if we talked about Z line to Z line, which is kind of like right here, there's your Z line, there's your Z line, and now when it's contracted because of the contact, it's made it shorter. Okay, that's what we're referring to there. Okay, so now you have that exposed site, myosin connects to actin, which is right here. All right, and then you have that shortened state. All right, so like it says here, once that neural impulse of the contraction subsides, Calcium then kind of flushes itself out. Myosin then detaches or unbinds from actin, and therefore the muscle contraction ends at that point. But just say that you're doing, um, uh, you're running a 5K, 
This has to happen over and over and over again to multiple sites at millions of times you know, per second. And so because of that, you end up with a situation where you have to always have calcium present during that time frame and that's where you know certain parameters of training and you know the different types of excitation are going to have to occur depending upon your mode of training okay so with that this kind of segues into that that conversation where you have different fiber types type 1 are slow twitch and then you have type 2 which are fast twitch now type 1 are what we consider to be more aerobically uh, compatible or they have a lot more aerobic capacity why? Because they have an increased oxygen delivery system. Um, they're slow to fatigue, just like an endurance-based type of muscle where you know, or an endurance-based type of activity to match the muscle. All right, and it allows for long-term contractions. All right, so therefore you can end up without fatiguing out, having sustained stabilization. Okay, whereas type two um, produces more force, but it's quick to fatigue, and you'll have short-term contractions. Okay. So that's one of the cool things with that. Now, um, you know, type one slow twitch, you're talking about anything that relates to, um, you're going to talk about anything that relates to um, aerobic. So you're talking about your rowing, your, your cross country skiing, your biking, um, running, jogging, walking, all right? Any of uh, um, biking, I wasn't sure if I said biking. And that would be, you know, cycling. All right, whereas type 2 is going to be more of your sport-based, I don't want to say all sport-based, but that's going to be your quick, you know, very fast, explosive types. So your baseballs, your basketballs, um, let's see, you know, soccer and hockey are kind of intermediate where they're going to have some slow, some fast. Uh, boxing is very fast twitch, but they have an aerobic base, okay? But a punch in boxing or a punch or a strike in MMA is very fast twitch. It's very explosive. Okay, so those are just, you know, football. Football is very fast twitch, and you have to be very explosive, and your plays don't last very long, so you have to, in a short period of time, do a lot of work. Okay. Um, muscle fiber arrangements, what we're talking about here um, is basically how, you know, if you look at the type on the left over here, okay, these different types are right, a fusiform, fan-shaped, longitudinal, quadrilateral, unipeniform, bipeniform, and then multipeniform. What those do is they cause these certain arrangements to pull in that direction. Okay, so if you look at, you know, your biceps brachii, it's a fusiform, and therefore it's parallel to the direction of the tendon. So if the tendon runs up and down, things that run up and down, that's where the line of pull is going to be. That's why your elbow wants to flex and extend. It's a very straight up and down motion, okay? <clears throat> That's just one example of that. But depending upon your, um, your, your muscle type is going to give you a different fiber arrangement and you're going to have different ways that the muscle runs. So therefore, you will have that line of pull in that direction to pace, based on what it is, okay? Um, if I go, you know, and this is why if you look at the bicep, you know, you can see that the, if you, you follow the arrow here, if you scroll up and down here, that's why you'll allow ha that line of pull to be parallel. If the tendon runs up and down, then the pull is going to be up and down, okay? Um, so in terms of other words that associate with, there's one word that is not in here that I see, but we'll talk about it in a second. Um, but muscles as movers, you have what we call your agonists or muscles. Um, agonists also are referred to as prime movers or the major muscles that will um, affect the motion of the joint. Okay, so as the example shows here, your gluteus maximus is an agonist or prime mover for hip extension. And just understand that if you were to place your hand on your gluteus maximus or your butt, obviously, um, and you were to take your leg and swing it, directly back or just gradually move it backward you can feel your gluteus maximus or your butt muscle tighten up and that's hip extension bringing the leg backwards not many movement with the leg with the knee or the ankle but just bringing that whole leg backward you can feel that it tightens up so that's an example of a prime mover for hip extension all right synergists are those muscles that help prime movers during 
a specific movement. So if we go to the hip extension again, synergist, if you were to be able to take your hand, now you know that it, your, your gluteus maximus is going to contract. Now what you can do is you can put your hand, if you can reach down that far and put it slightly on the hamstring, and you can feel there's slight contraction and, or a, a tightening up of the hamstring group, the three muscles that run you know, from right below or right on the hip down to the knee. Okay, <clears throat> those will slightly contract and allow for an assistance or you know uh, uh, a synergistic accompaniment for hip extension. You know, and then the erector spinae group is also another one for uh, spinal functioning to make sure that you are stabilized at that point. Okay, and then stabilizers during this time of hip extension. All right, those are going to be a supporting or stabilizing mechanism to assist the prime movers and synergists, and so they all work together. All right, and so therefore you'll have your transverse. Wow, that's crazy. They didn't spell it right. Transverse abdominis, your internal oblique, um, your multifidus. They all that you know. Those are all stabilizers for the low back, and then the pel. You know, um, pelvis. Um, excuse me, I'm. <laughs> Excuse me. The transverse abdominis, the internal obliques, and then the multifidus all help with stabilizing the low back. But also during that same time, it doesn't allow any sort of t you know crazy amounts of tilt within the pelvis, and then also the um, hip itself will not drive itself into a bad movement pattern, and that will all be during the hip extension. So you can see that there's a lot going on in just one simple movement of just bringing your leg back. So that's why when we talk about, you know, muscle, muscle groups, it's hard to really sit there and go, okay, well, it's only one muscle because usually there's way more than just one, okay, that's acting in some way, whether it be the prime mover or it's something that's stabilizing or assisting, you know, it just depends on what the motion is, okay. Um, your endocrine system, obviously the glands um, that, you know, that will end up secreting hormones, all right. Now, without hormones, you will not have messages sent, you know, throughout the system. So, therefore, the body can't act in a certain a certain manner. So, what are we talking about here? The host gland. Okay, um, the host gland is where the hormones live. Okay, chemical messengers, which are going to be the senders, and then the target cells are what needs to change through those hormones coming in. Okay. And so without hormones coming in, you won't have a regulation of body functions. Like it says, you won't grow. There will be a, a difference in metabolism. And then responses to stress are also another way as well. Okay, and those all can be affected just by the simple uh, hormone imbalance that you, know, you could develop if you're not taking care of your system. All right, um, primary glands here, your pituitary, you have both your anterior and posterior. Those have a lot of very important glands. You know, pituitary is considered your master gland, which there's a lot of very important hormones that come from there. You have your hypothalamus. You have your thyroid gland, your adrenal glands. All right, now, if, <coughs> excuse me, if you have an issue with any of those, the complications can occur, and like we were talking about before, hormonal imbalances can become an issue at that point as well. So therefore, you end up with um, concerns over that function as well. So therefore, if the gland isn't working correctly, the target cells that are going to accept the hormones that are going to come to them may not work correctly, and therefore you're going to lack certain issue, you know, certain mechanisms for your functioning. All right. So when we talked about the pituitary, there's you know your anterior secretes, as we've shown here, growth hormone, very important for maturation or growth. Prolactin, you have what's called your ACTH um, or your adrenal gland. Um, for your, from your adrenal glands, you have your TSH, which is your from your thyroid. You have your FSH, which is for sex organs, and your LH, which is for sex organs themselves as well. Um, follicle stimulating hormone, you know, luteinizing hormone. Um, those are all very important for that. Oh, whoops, wrong way. Your intermediates, like here, we're talking about, secretes MSH, which is for your skin. And then um, diuretic hormones and diuretic hormones for fluid retention and oxytocin for childbirth. All those can come into play via the posterior pituitary gland. 
All right, your thyroid, like we said earlier, regulates your metabolism. Your your adrenal glands are going to help with the fight or flight or epinephrine, which is true adrenaline, and then norepinephrine. Okay, um, and then because of this, you know, with your adrenal glands plus your testes, your, you know, this is why men are able to produce more testosterone at that point as well. Okay. So getting into blood glucose control, you know, some people may see it as blood sugar. I'm referring to it as blood glucose because that's the right way we want to discuss it, especially from an exercise science standpoint. Um, we need to be very aware that there are two major hormones that are present during the time of blood glucose levels, one being insulin and the other being glucagon, and they're both very important. One's not more important than the other because it helps you to stay um, more in a homeostasis you know, level or more balance of blood glucose. So what's the difference between the two? Really simply, insulin will help to lower blood sugar or blood glucose, okay? What it will do is it'll take glucose that's found in the bloodstream and it'll put it into cells to either be stored or used for certain purposes, okay? Whereas glucagon, you know, and um, insulin is released from the pancreas where, you know, glucagon realizes that um, glycogen stores are, um, or gluc excuse me, glucose levels are low in the system, so you're almost like hypoglycemic, and what will happen is glucagon will, you know, become present when the liver and the muscles detect that there are no glycogen in them, so therefore, you know, there's again that signal that is sent that glucagon's released, so then it can then release um, glycogen from the liver and the muscles and put it back into the blood system so that you become more um, level. Okay, so insulin again wants to lower blood sugar, glucagon wants to elevate blood sugar or blood glucose so that it can maintain its balance within the system as well. Okay, um, one of the cool things about you know exercise is that insulin and glucagon can work efficiently and they'll become more sensitive to exercise. They'll be more sensitive to the way that the body reacts to insulin um, and so that you can feel better and then you can have a better regulation of blood glucose overall. All right. Um, the effects of exercise itself on epinephrine, we know that they're going to have an increased heart rate. You're going to have um, elevated blood glucose, and then it opens the airways to allow for more breathing, and that's your true fight-or-flight response, okay? So <clears throat> what happens here is um, you'll end up with, um, you know, an, an excite. We talked about it before, is that when epinephrine is released, that is what we call a sympathetic response to exercise, which means that there's going to be an elevation in many different things, okay? And that's truly your fight or flight. You know, that, that again, um, you know, body temperature can rise. You can have, you know, reddened skin. There's a lot of different things that happen when an epinephrine is released, okay? In terms of hormones... Um, you know, understanding that both men and women do produce testosterone, obviously you can see that there's a massive difference between that. Um, understand that um, men and women can both produce estrogen. Obviously women have the more productive for that hormone. Um, cortisol is, you know, equivalent for both men and women. Um, normally we consider cortisol to be the stress hormone. And it's, it can be, as you can see here, we, one of the words that exercisers and trainers don't ever want to see is catabolic. Um, cortisol produces a catabolic effect. But here's the thing. We produce uh, cortisol when we exercise, okay? And that's okay because the body understands how to regulate it at that point. And we know that there are, is stressors that happen on the system, but our body can regulate it better. But what our body also knows how to do if our diet is on point and our exercise training is on regimen is we can offset that and create more of an anabolic effect to decrease the slight effect cortisol may have on our system. So whenever we train, you know, you do go into a catabolic state because you're breaking things down, but we try to offset that through diet and exercise modifications to keep us in an anabolic state over a catabolic state if possible. So if you want to go into a starvation type of diet or you want to eat very minimal calories and then train as hard as you can, you're going to, you know, you're not going to gain what you thought you were going to gain. So it becomes a, a, a challenge at that point. Okay. Um, growth hormone. Growth hormone is really important as an anabolic agent for growth. Okay. Um, very important, you know, mixed with testosterone, you know, they, they both have to be present for us to have a decent amount of growth in our system. 
Um, and then the thyroid is uh, our major importance for, you know, and two of the main mechanisms are the T3 and T4 hormone because they have a really big relationship to metabolism. So people who have hormonal imbalances from the thi or thyroid hormone, T3, T4 imbalances really can have an issue with um, either high weight loss or high weight gain depending upon if they're hypo or hypo, hyper or hypo um, in terms of their, uh, their hormone production. All right, so we understand that exercise can elevate all of these in a positive manner and make them better, okay? So ultimately, we need to seem to understand that there, it, it's not just one system that takes over at one time. It's not just your muscular system. We have to understand that the nervous system also comes into play. We have to understand the skeletal system comes into play. We have to understand the, you know, that it's not, you know, then you have to talk about your endocrine system. So without any of that, working synergistically, and I don't mean the way that we talked about it, but working together, you'll have an optimal movement environment. Whereas if we look at it from the perspective of if one predom you know, one is more predominant than the other, or one system wants to take over more than the other, we can have a major problem with that as well. All right, so this is chapter two. This is, um, a, you know, a, a very important chapter, especially for, you know, just having that basic exercise science and refresher for some of us. So, and this could be like an eye-opener and a new sort of mechanism for, you know, people getting back into the flow of this. So um, we'll see you again here for chapter three. Thanks.